let me welcome all of you here to the Mimarinic Public Library, and let me be the first to thank the Public Library and the representative here, Lori Friedley, for inviting me to uh, come and talk a little bit about my book and about my teaching career and what I see, uh, hopefully, uh, for the future of education. So, um, so thanks to the Mimarinic Public Library, which I have a very uh, very fond memories of because I've spent many times here with students uh, coming uh, with Lori to help them with their research skills when we would do projects. And the very last thing that I ever did in teaching was at Westchester Day School when we did a um, photography show called Gazing Geometry. And uh, <clears throat> that was uh, trying to teach the students geometry uh, through a more creative way. Uh, so the students learned about triangles and pentagons and hexagons and circles and uh, squares. Uh, and they had to get a camera mm -hmm. and go out into the community or anywhere that they wanted to and take pictures of geometric, uh, the geometric figures. And we had a wonderful show. We had about 100, 150, every student uh, submitted pictures and uh, every student was represented in the show and it was down on this floor and we had an opening uh, in June of uh, 2007 and uh, it was a great, you know, all the parents came, the students came and they were able to show off their photographs and talk about them and uh, that was uh, the final project that I did in my teaching career. Wow. So, uh, wow. teaching Very career cool. spanned 38 years, and I have to say that they were all in Mamaroneck, all wow. 38 years. Uh, I started off at Mamaroneck Avenue School, teaching three years um, under the uh, direction of Mr. Krauss, who was the principal at the time. And after the third year, was given the most wonderful opportunity by uh, the most forward-thinking uh, educator that I've ever met in my life, Dr. Calvert Schlick. Oh, yes. He allowed me to uh, come up with a program. Mm -hmm. So with my parents' help, uh, we came up with the name Actionville. Ville, of course, would be a place, and a place where there would be a lot going on. So it came out to be called Actionville. And it lasted 13 years at Mamaroneck Avenue School. <clears throat> and then the enrollment started to decrease in his 13th, 12th and 13th year, so the superintendent at the time thought it would be better if it was centrally located. Centrally located, moved it to central. So the first 13 years were really the testing ground of Actionville. They were the trial, tribulation, those were the good times and those were the stressful times because it was a brand new program and some people really liked it, and some really didn't like it, and it was always uh, that. You either liked mm -hmm. it or you didn't like it. <clears throat> so that was the beginning, and it was 13 great years, I have to say. We had wonderful space. We had a, a stairway leading into the gym that we used as a ski slope, uh, which people say, how could you have possibly skied on a stairway? Well, you hold on to the banister, and we use cardboard skis, and we used mats to have the kids go down. So it was a great space. We were in the basement, and uh, nobody bothered us, basically. But then we got to Central, and we didn't have such great space. And the things that we would do would be a little more unique, and there they, we were not as well, uh, you know, we were not as well understood, because uh, we have a trip to the center of the earth, and, you know, maybe our volcano or our pool might leak and it might leak down to the next class and see there were some things that just just didn't uh, this didn't work out but then um, on the 20th year we were lucky enough to move to comics and under the direction of the, the most wonderful principal uh, that I have ever worked with uh, Rick North the was the renaissance of the Actionville program the last 10 years were the mm -hmm. most phenomenal years we had once again just like Maranick Avenue, we were, had dedicated space. Uh, we were in an old the cafeteria that was no longer used and a number of rooms that were no longer used. And since we were fifth and sixth in the homics, which was seven and eight, they didn't really bother with us. So once again, we rose uh, to, uh, to great things in the last 10 years. 
then when Action Bill closed for any number of reasons, which I'm not going to go into right now, uh, I was asked if I wanted to teach sixth grade social studies uh, in the homics program. And once again, they knew my reputation and they just more or less let me do my own thing. Uh, so I was, uh, I had a great time at working with uh, a larger number of students at the Homics. And uh, then I retired from the Marinick and I spent a year um, uh, doing some uh, consulting work uh, at different schools. And then my last, the plum, or the cherry on top of the cake, came in my last two years when I was uh, given the job to work at the Westchester Day School. Uh, and I had, uh, once again, a most wonderful head of school there, Dr. Uh, uh, Rabbi Einzig, who allowed me to do Actionville in the fifth grade there. And it was really amazing because I had the kids half a day, and then the other half a day they have uh, their Hebrew studies. So I would have half of the kids in the morning and half in the afternoon, but I accomplished a great amount of things with uh, those students uh, as well. So I really did have a wonderful right. teaching career. I mean, as I say, it spanned 38 years from the very first day at um, uh, Marinick Avenue School to my final day at Westchester Day School. And I have to admit that it was probably the 38 of the most wonderful years that any one person could <laughs> ever imagine. And I say that because I never felt it was a job. I always loved what I did. And I always felt that the students, most of them, at least 90% I would think, mm -hmm. always enjoyed what I was doing. So it made my, my life so easy that I was able to have a number of other jobs. I was a travel agent after school for many years. And of course, I used all my travel knowledge yeah. to book the best trips for the students to Florida, New Orleans, and <laughs> Nashville, and 10th year Hawaii, and Washington, D.C., and uh, uh, Toronto. So many trips to Toronto, always flying somewhere, and always flying if we could uh, help it. Um, and uh, I also worked uh, at A&S, which is the... Um, Old, where Macy's is now, uh, as a supervisor there. And after that, I worked in Playland as a uh, as the Kitty Land manager, and I worked at New Rock in their <laughs> video. And everywhere I worked, I used those places to help me with Actionville. Mm -hmm. I would gather a lot of my assistants from those workers, and I would take the students to Playland, and we'd, do, we'd film there for a historical play, or we would go to the uh, New Rock to do a thing called the Video Vision and how you can relate entertainment to education. So I, nothing was ever not done just at, for a whim. All these jobs were put together to help me with the Actionville program. And uh, the, people used to say, well, you're doing Actionville work at ANS, or you're doing... Um, uh, Actionville work, you're booking a trip at the travel. And these were all always interrelated. Mm. And uh, just one other funny story about the presidential election. <clears throat> Each year we elect the Actionville president. And of course, the students would run and the teachers wanted to have a candidate, so we'd have Mr. Dokes run. And I'd always get the operator from ANS to call all the students over so many nights and say, this is the Doak's headquarters and we're calling to speak to someone. And, and the parents would be laughing in the background knowing that this was really not the Doak's headquarters. But I would get the operator who wasn't doing anything, you know, if she wasn't answering any calls at AMS, to make these calls. So I was always able to get someone somewhere somehow to benefit the educational programs that I was working in. So um, that's a little bit about me, and I just wanted to find out from any of you, uh, before I talk a little bit more, do you have any favorite memories that you would like to share? And if you would, if you would just say your name and what, you know, not, not necessarily the year, but when you actually were in uh, or what school you were at during the time I was teaching. Does anybody like to share a memory? I'm Steve Mandrakia. I was in the early years of Actionville. 
And I remember our trip to the Grand Canyon, which I believe was 1974 or 75, if I'm not mistaken. And we had our Actionville shirts on, which were these, they were uh, blue and yellow, if I'm not mistaken. And they had, it was the early days, I guess, of embossing shirts, and it said Actionville on it. And it was kind of, the ink was kind of rubbery and kind of thick. And I just remember it being, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is a newer version, but the shirt, it, uh, it was really thick on it, and it was so hot at the Grand Canyon <laughs> that the letters on my shirt were melting. <laughs> and one of my friends came up to me and just went like that and drew a line through it, and I had to get a new shirt when we got back. But that was an incredible trip. Uh, I never forgot uh, that and the Hoover Dam. Wow. We went. It, was, uh, it was a wonderful time. Maria Klaus. I remember 6 o'clock in the morning picking up students to go to sell pens at the train station. <laughs> and also, uh, the time that I was with Actionville, uh, we did the thing about the Hawaiian Islands and you had uh, the police boat bring in the British and the people on land were the Hawaiian natives and we had a big luau and everything. So, And, and I just want to say, because I got the floor, that part of my teaching career is benefited by what I experienced with you. <clears throat> my name is Andre Friedley. We had fun uh, doing the, the World Expo. We built a, uh, a Swiss chalet at the, uh, in the cafeteria, uh, complete with the roof, the, uh, uh, the uh, geranium on the, uh, in the box in the front uh, window. Uh, we had a goat uh, standing by. And uh, we had... Uh, <clears throat> as part of the uh, interactive uh, uh, element of the show, we had a safe, a Swiss, Swiss bank safe that the kids had to open with um, uh, chocolate as a reward. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there was uh, also a requirement of uh, uh, something moving, and that was the, uh, the Matterhorn. We built the Matterhorn of papier mache, and we had a, a cable car going up and down this side, and that was, uh, that was pretty amazing. <laughs> My name is Paul Abramson, and uh, I don't know whether, I guess I was on the school board the year that Lauren was a student there. Uh, I just glanced at something. I don't remember that our classroom was in the basement. I do remember that it was two rooms together. I thought they were upstairs a little the first year. But I remember particularly the uh, trip to Washington was not like you described those fancy things you had later. <laughs> uh, we took a bus, buses. Uh, your father inspected the tires of each of the buses and made them change one before we left. Uh, we, took the bus, we took the bus all the way to Washington, I do believe. Mm -hmm. uh, we came back by train which was another story because when we got into Penn Station and realized that we then had to get onto a different train to get to the Maranek, we were spread all over two cars of the train without any thoughts of picking them up. But uh, it was a fabulous trip. You divided us up. Well, <laughs> we had a doctor who was parent of a, uh, Gene Wasserman's daughter was in the, in the group. So he came with us, and uh, which reassured some of the parents. Um, we uh, divided up as we went. I was, because I had a, we didn't have enough female members of the team, the adults. So I was in charge of a group of four girls who were sleeping together in one of the rooms. You trusted me to do that since one of the kids was my daughter. The other was, another was Virginia, I think of her last Virginia name. Virginia Siebert. Siebert, who remains a close friend of my daughter. Uh, and we took kids out, a guy named Guglielmo. You may have known him. He came from that, got lost, I remember that, uh, from our group. And I remember that the kids had an opportunity to choose where they wanted to go, and they all wanted to go to the Smithsonian, and we went to the air and space part of it. We had a half a day left over, 
And I said, well, can I choose a place to go? So they let me reluctantly take them to the National Museum of Art. And we walked in the door and were confronted with, with a whole bunch of paintings of nudes. So they decided that maybe it was a pretty good place to go. These were <laughs> fifth, fifth grade boys were, that were suddenly saw this kind of art. But more important, there was a special exhibit of Durer work. And they were fascinated by how he worked and how, and they learned something. They learned a great deal. Uh, so it was not just fun and games at all. It was a very instructional kind of thing. Then we ate in a couple of terrible restaurants. <laughs> we made it, and we enjoyed it, and we became very good friends all the way. The only sad part, and things memories start coming, if you remember, we had a pair of twins with us, and their father died. Angeletta was the name. And we, yeah, another person you would know. Uh, and uh, at least I'm assuming that you, uh, I know you're fine. No, he was a little, a few years. No, but, after, but yeah. from the same neighborhood. <laughs> we were, yeah, we crossed. Uh, so, anyway, that was a wonderful trip. And I thought it was a great year for my daughter. And we, on the board, fought to make sure that Actionville remained in, intact. So. And it was uh, through people like yourself, uh, and other board members and in people in the uh, administration that really supported the program. So, well, thank you very much. I do remember that trip, and you'll, ha you'll be happy to know that the, one of the last trips we took was by bus also. <laughs> Central, you know, Marinick Avenue, we did such wonderful trips. I mean, we were gone all the time. We were at Disney World, I don't know how many times, studying transportation and studying the American Revolution and studying the history of Disney and, and water. And, and every year we would go on a big trip, Disney, or we went to the World's Fair in uh, uh, New Orleans, and we went to the World's Fair in Knoxville, and we went to Hawaii. And when we got to Central, they didn't like it anymore. They said, no, if our kids can't go, why should you go? And they persuaded the powers to be to make it a limit of only 500 miles that we could go. Of course, it didn't even, it didn't, that, that rule didn't even stick because we went to Toronto every other year from then and it was more than 500 miles, but we could either go to Toronto or Washington, so the whole rest of the Actionville time, it was back and forth. And it wasn't until 2001 that, uh, since I had won the Disney Award, that I persuaded the board at the time to let us go back to Disney to be back to our roots, because it was the last year of Actionville anyway, and they, they agreed, but that was uh, pretty interesting. So thank you for those uh, comments on the trip. Does anybody else want to share anything? I'm Claire Wolkoff, and both my children were in Actionville about 30 years ago at Central School, and now I know why none of these fancy trips are ringing a bell with me. So, uh, But what I remember is, one thing I definitely remember, all the action bill auctions and I think we still have some stuff around our house from those auctions where we had to go and buy things every year and I remember the math kind of skills and the casino and the banking and in addition to you know the fun things I did around here I have a question for you yes Do you remember because we can't remember the name of the restaurant they went we went to a restaurant it was you called it El Presidente do you remember what? It's was it no a, longer in existence in Larchmont. Do you remember what it was? Uh, real name? Well, the ones we went to was the Carriage House. That was in Larchmont. The Crab Shanty was in Mamarinic. So Those it was were the Carriage the, House, yeah. But whenever we drive by, it's like doctor's office. Oh, oh, it's the Carriage House, yes. Yeah. That was El Presidente yeah. during the Opera right. Day, yes. Yeah. Okay. yeah, that closed up a long yes, time yes. ago. <laughs> um, I'm Lori Friedley, and um, one of my loveliest, loveliest memories um, has to do with the general action bill as opposed to the two years that my daughter was there, although she had some great memories too. And I do remember my next door neighbors asking us why we were building a covered wagon in the front yard. But um, as my specific memory is seeing the delight on the children's faces when they came to the library to do research on their countries. 
So I got to see it from a little bit of a removed um, perspective, but the joy and the happiness and the delight to actually be able to do something, to be able to teach other children what they were researching was just phenomenal, mm -hmm. just phenomenal. So, and also on the, the year that um, I succeeded Judy Silverstein as um, mother of, uh, you know, the P, well, whatever, it wasn't exactly a PTA, but similar to a PTA, my house was like Grand Central Station. So, it was pretty cool. Thank you. It was pretty cool. And then we would do these dances that everybody danced to, the Hokey Pokey and the Mexican Hat Dance and uh, the Tarantella and the Hora and the Alley Cat. So we learned all, and the Cha Cha Slide. So we moved right along with this. As the dances changed, we changed along with them. So now uh, I made up this, you know, there couldn't be, it had to be some visual thing mm -hmm. if it was action built. So I thought I would unveil the top 10 uh, memories that I have of action built and uh, previous and post. And uh, so number 10 is economics. Now, economics was uh, uh, taught many different times in Actionville. And I always had this dream of uh, being a fan of roller coasters and being a member of ACE, which is the American Coaster Enthusiasts, that I wanted to create a restaurant called Coasters. So I was lucky enough, I was working at Playland at the time, so I lured about four of my workers to come to work at Actionville and open up Coaster's Restaurant as part of an economics project. So we had, we were in the hammocks, we had the cafeteria, the, my, assist, my staff was cooking, the kids acted, uh, they were the uh, bussers, they were the waiters and waitresses, they were the uh, welcomers, they took care of the finances, they collected the checks, they uh, cleaned the tables, they made up the roller coaster uh, pla placemats, which were word searches. They figured out how to put uh, roller coaster videos on, uh, playing during the uh, time people were in the restaurant. And they also set up computers at the tables where uh, the guests could build a roller coaster through a Disney program or through Sim City. So, Economics was certainly a fun thing. And uh, so we were always doing something. At Maranek Avenue School, we did something called pick a trick cards, where we would uh, teach the students how to uh, assembly line works. And so the students had to, one had to cut the card, the other had to put the cards together, another one had to put it under the slap, another one had to take the cards and put them in the package. And they worked and they learned about the uh, Henry Ford concept of. Uh, the assembly line. And then we did um, uh, all kinds of other uh, economic uh, lessons and uh, one of the interesting things we did too was um, uh, we took a song called Tell Star, which was an instrumental that was made many years ago and the students wanted to update the song. So we had to figure out how do we get rights to the song. So they researched it and they went back and they went to New York City to get the copyright to find out if we could press certain song, certain the song on certain discs. And we were given permission free, because it was a school economics program, to produce the 2000 version of the song Telstar. And while I was working at New Rock's ice skating rink, another, another one of my jobs, I was the DJ there. So I had a one night where I unveiled the song. So we had the biggest crowd ever because wow. all the students and, and all the parents came. And as everybody was skating on the ice skating rink, we were unveiling the uh, new song, Telstar 2000. So uh, trying to get different kinds of lessons that might be boring or sort of not interesting. We try to do things in action, but always to make things more fun and, and uh, have the students more involved in what's going on. Number nine is historical plays. Historical plays were done almost every year. This is where we started off with doing the plays live. So everybody would uh, act out the, you were in a play, I'm sure. And did you get an Oscar? 
I don't think I did. <laughs> yeah. uh, we did historical plays, and they were very like all, all dramatic things, like Mary Queen of Scots, where she lost her head, or Joan of Arc, she got burned. And we had to come up with ways of doing these things. And uh, my favorite plays uh, were three. One of them was uh, based on Yankee Doodle Dandy, and I had um, a whole skit with uh, was uh, George M. Cohan. It was the whole thing about him and going off and uh, give my regards to Broadway. The second one was King Arthur. That's so popular. I just mm -hmm. saw that there's a new movie out, King Arthur. So it spans almost uh, 40 or 50 years since we did King Arthur. And filming on different, uh, that was filming. So at first, like with um, uh, Yankee Doodle Dandy, we had to do everything live. So everything was done. The students would sit in front. The kids would do their performance. And it was all done live. And then we did, we awarded Oscars. The kids would get a ballot, Price Waterhouse. Hopefully we didn't make any mistakes like they did this past year. Uh, and kids would get Oscars. We made them in art class, little, little figures. And, and that didn't last long because the Oscars, most of them lost their head and they were just, it just didn't work out. But the plays lasted a long time and we moved from doing them live to taping them. So then we would go on location. I went many times to uh, Sheldrake and to uh, <clears throat> uh, down to the manor to film on location. Mm. And we did uh, King Arthur and we had to throw the sword in. I think it was over at Saxon Woods somewhere where they had water and they had to throw the sword in. And, and it was just a lot of fun doing all those plays. And uh, my favorite one was Thoroughly Modern Millie, was the Roaring Twenties. <clears throat> and we had... Uh, we were in need of a bathtub because it's part of the Roaring Twenties and they were, <clears throat> the, the tub was filled with gin and so on. Ours was filled with balloons, but uh, I had it, I asked around and they said, we could get you a cast iron bathtub, but it's filled with rocks. Oh my God. So I called Dr. Slick and I said, is there any way that buildings and grounds could go pick up this uh, bathtub? And of course, you know, most of the things were uh, in the affirmative. So they went out, they had to take all the rocks out, and they had to carry this cast iron, they had to put it in the truck, and oh then God. take it over to Actionville just for our historical play. And I had a part in the play. So when it was filmed and it was shown that night, somebody came over and said to me, Oh, that, that tall kid, he was really funny. <laughs> oh, and of course, I didn't say that I was playing that part. So it's, oh yeah, I forget who that was, but it, it was a very funny part. So uh, then we had the tub, and what were we going to do with it? Nobody wanted it back, and it was too heavy. So I asked the students to tell me in a contest, what, what would you want to do with the tub? And the winning entry was, make it a chair, the bath chair. And it lasted in Actionville for, I'd say, oh, maybe 20 years and it was still there on my last day at, at comic school. And the kids used to buy, because buy to sit in it, mm. uh, because it was filled with pillows and very comfortable, and you could lay back as if in the bathtub and do, you know, and, and take a part in our reading class. So the historical plays were number nine. Number eight is the Thomas Paine home. <clears throat> and um, Thomas Paine was a great patriot, and living in New Rochelle, he, this is the one big historical attraction in the city. And when I was young, I would be taken there by my parents and learn about Thomas Paine and all he did for the American Revolution. You know, common sense, the uh, sun, sunshine patriot. <clears throat> and when I started teaching, I wanted my students to go to the Thomas Paine home as well. So we had many trips there. Now this culminated uh, with um, a project that we did uh, towards the end of the Actionville uh, years, uh, in the late 90s, when we were given an opportunity to remodel the museum. The museum had fallen into disarray mm. and the projects were horrible. So my staff and students went there, we looked over the site, we saw what, what it was, what, what, could, what we could do, and we produced an interdisciplinary uh, book on activities that could be done in the museum. And all the materials we donated to the museum that the students who visited could actually do hands-on 
multidisciplinary approach to uh, Thomas Paine. So we had Paine and science, and a Paine and math, and social studies, and geography, and art, and music, and we even had videotaping. And it was a big project, and uh, was an honor for our uh, school program to actually remodel a museum. So we, I was. We had the computer lab too. Yeah, and the computer lab. Yeah, they never had it. That's right. You were there, uh, and. Uh, it was really a great project and one that I'm still very proud of. And number seven is Harbor Day. I'm sure most of you remember Harbor Day where uh, we have some theme. Like you had said, we landed Captain Cook and we, we always had a theme and we always went to the harbor at least once a year. Sometimes it rained and we had to postpone it, but I'd say most times we were pretty lucky and we were able to uh, uh, get the full day in. Uh, usually the day started with some event. Uh, my favorite events were number one, the gold rush. And this is where I sent my staff to find hundreds of small rocks. And then they had to get spray paint all these rocks gold. Then they went to the harbor and they tossed all the rocks into the harbor. And then the students were, were prepared. They were dressed uh, with boots on and so on. They knew that they were going to stake a claim. And all the students, they were uh, cooperative groups, they would stake their claim, uh, put up sticks so that no one else could go into that area. And once all the claims were staked, students were able to wade into the water and look for the gold. And they would collect gold, and then they would bring it to the assay station, which was the mathematics part, in which they had to turn in, weigh the gold, and turn it into dollars and then of course the group that had the most goal was given a prize so that was a lot of fun uh, doing a, and the kids loved it because they were they loved going in the water and looking for the goal and excited when they found a bigger piece and so on the other uh, one that occurred was back in 76 and that was during the um, bicentennial we recreated the uh, revolutionary war so we were very fortunate to have the harbor patrol again, load our uh, Native American costume students onto the boat, and uh, they had the tea, and they threw the tea in the harbor. The only problem was trying to retrieve all those boxes out of the harbor, because the kids were not interested in that, they just wanted to throw the tea in the harbor. <laughs> and, and the other funny thing is I wanted to make it as authentic as possible, so we wanted to have Paul Revere come, but we just didn't want him to come. We wanted him to ride in. Mm. So I contacted uh, Westchester Stables up, up on Mamaroneck Avenue, and, they, uh, and I had one of my teacher aides practice riding the horse, so I knew everything was all right. And they said, well, we'll put the horse in, uh, in the cart or whatever, and we'll bring him down to Harbor Island. So that morning, I get a call from, the, from them, and they say, the cart broke down. You won't be able to have the horse. I said, oh, no. I said, that's terrible, it's, part, it's a big thing. I said, what if I send my uh, teacher aide and he could ride the horse down? <laughs> he did, he rode the horse down the Maranick Avenue, much to the chagrin of all the motorists. But he arrived at Harbor Island yelling, the British are coming, the students, and the students were so excited, screaming and yelling that the British were coming, that the horse got frightened and almost went right into the harbor. So, uh, lo and behold, the cart was fixed by the end of the day, and they came and got the horse, and I was very happy that that situation ended. Um, and the other funny thing about Harbor is that we always had a fireworks display at the end of the show. I mean, at the end of the, the evening. And um, the first time we ever did it, uh, I guess Stephen was in the program, and we were going to do aerial fireworks. But of course, I didn't get any permission to do aerial fireworks, which uh, I figured you could just do them. Well, they just can't do them. And as the aerial fireworks started to go off, people on uh, Boston Post Road wanted to stop and see the fireworks, which caused a huge traffic jam. <laughs> and the police uh, came and they were yelling, stop this show, stop this show. And then <clears throat> luckily, luckily enough, that Stephen's sister was one of my teaching assistants. And just so happens that her uncle was a chief of police. And she called him and said, oh, let us finish the show. <laughs> and the show was finished. But then we were finished because we never did aerial fireworks. We always did ground fireworks. 
And I always got permission after that. And we always had the fire department there just in case. So uh, we learned a lot of lessons over the years at Actionville. Uh, uh, in the book, there's a whole chapter on uh, unfortunate events that took place. Uh, and at the time, they were, you know, very stressful. And, but uh, today, I just laugh about most of them. And then number six is what many of you have talked about already. I just love World's Fairs. And I think I love them so much is because back in 63 and 64, I spent so many days at the New York World's Fair. And I just loved it. I just love learning about countries and what each country has to offer and the foods of the countries and the sights of the countries. And also of the corporate pavilions, IBM, uh, Johnson, uh, Johnson's Wax, uh, Pepsi, Disney, they all had great pavilions at the New York World's Fair. So I thought, well, we have to have a World's Fair at Actionville. And we did. We had many almost every year, and uh, those of you might remember them, uh, and the hard work and efforts that were put into these, uh, um, these uh, extravaganzas, as Mr. Uh, Friedley has already stated, you had to have a working model, and you had to have food, and you had to have some geography, and you had to have the history, and you have to have uh, uh, games for little kids and games for bigger kids. So there were a huge amount uh, of uh, ingredients, <coughs> and, that, and that was uh, really uh, a lot of fun. I always had a great day visiting, and we'd open it in the night so all the parents could come, and the brothers and the sisters, and, and truly Actionville was a program for families. The whole family was involved. You know, you just couldn't come to Actionville. You had to bring your whole family to Actionville. Uh, and even at Westchester Day, the families were totally involved in the, um, in the process of education, which is uh, uh, a rarity, I guess, in today's world and something that I'm very grateful for. So, and then we go to number five, which is, of course, the end of the year trips. And those range... <laughs> As I said at the earlier part of my talk, most of the times went to uh, Orlando in the beginnings of Actionville. And of course, I became friendly with the people who worked at Disney so that we were able to get rooms at the Contemporary Hotel. Otherwise, you could never get in because they were always booked up and a good deal on tickets. So um, end of the year trips, uh, probably most spectacular was in year number 10 to celebrate our 10th anniversary we wanted to go to Hawaii. And of course, uh, that's where the students wanted to go. And that caused great, a great amount of discussion in the school district. Why do the kids have to go to Hawaii? Why can't they just go to Washington like everybody else goes? Why do they have to raise so much money to go? And the, uh, I'll never forget the journal news at the time. The editor, her name was Ina Meyer. And she wrote an article, an editorial, which stated, uh, basically, why not let students dream big and let them fulfill their dreams? And this way they will uh, learn a great deal from hard work. They had to mm -hmm. work hard, as you said, they had to get up in the morning, 6 o'clock to go sell pens at train stations. And the auction, that auction that happened every year, and all those big fat pens we sold over the years, smiley faces, and, they ra and hot dog sales and pizza yeah. sales, and they raised a lot of money. So. They did go to Hawaii, and that was a trip of a lifetime for many students, and it was very educational. We met with the governor. He welcomed us into his uh, office, the governor of Hawaii, and he spent more than 45 minutes answering students' questions about the culture of Hawaii and the Hawaiian people, and um, he, he just thought it was a wonderful experience for himself to have students come all the way from New York. And at that time, 1980, it was a rarity. And some of the other trips I remember are, of course, New Orleans, New Orleans World's Fair. And that was sort of funny because uh, uh, one night some of the kids went out. They said, well, we want to go for a walk. So I said, well, all right, not too far. So we were walking, and it was across Bourbon Street. And, of course, we had to stop the walk and go right back to the hotel because, yeah. you know, Bourbon Street. But um, the Knoxville World's Fair was very good. Uh, our trips to Orlando were always very exciting. Uh, we went to the Everglades, we went to St. Augustine, uh, we went to Nashville, uh, we went to the Grand Canyon, which was a tremendous trip. We went to Mexico, uh, we went to uh, California a few times. So we were really, 
we, we our dreams were always big. Mm -hmm. And if you could dream, our Actionville motto, if you could dream it, you can achieve it. And the mere fact that all of these trips did take place and they were all successful, and thank God nothing ever really happened to anyone on the trips, um, and we were just, just, mm -hmm. it was just wonderful. <clears throat> the trip to the Grand Canyon, though, I'll never forget, we were kind of worried because there's no guardrails at the Grand Canyon. <clears throat> so I would have the kids practice every day, walking as if this was, a, as if this was the end of the canyon. We don't want any. And then uh, when we got there, I had all the teachers lined up so the kids could look, but not go past where the teacher was because you know it was kind of scary. And the other thing is, you said that we went to Hoover Dam. Well, before Hoover Dam, we landed in Las Vegas. And of course, another silly idea of mine. Everybody give your chaperone four quarters, and they will pull the slot machines, and the odds are, we had to do the odds, some so-and-so, so many kids would win or something. Well, it was in the airport, and of course, the, you know, well, we're doing Johnny's four quarters, you know, and each teacher would call out the name, and, and Johnny would try to get closer and closer to the machine. And of course, you couldn't get that close to the machine because you had to be uh, 18 at the time to get there. So the, as the lady came along, I'm calling the sheriff. These kids are too close. I'm calling the sheriff. <laughs> and she would go on and, and I said, oh, just one more student, one more student. So finally she said, that's it, I'm calling him. And we just got all the kids out and we went down to the bus. And, we, and the bus drivers are standing there like this. And I said, what's the matter? They said, this is the first tour ever that comes to Las Vegas. We collect all the bags. The bags are all on the bus and there's no people yeah. on the bus. I saw we were playing the slot machines, that's why, all that time. So that was another <clears throat> funny story that occurred on that trip. So, number four, <clears throat> thanks to Judy Silverstein uh, and Ned Benton, who were former parents, they nominated Actionville for the Golden Apple Award. The Golden Apple Award was the first award given by Westchester County, in Westchester County, by the Journal News and the New York State Lottery. They were looking for the most creative program in all of Westchester and Rockland. And all the programs, these, a lot of programs were nominated, and uh, we were received word that we were one of the finalists. And of course it was a, it was a vindication for the program basically after so many years of people saying it, the kids are having too much fun, they're not learning anything, or they're listening to music, or they're talking, or they're not quiet or whatever. Uh, winning the Golden Apple Award was a, a, a huge uh, success for us and uh, uh, it was a, it's a beautiful award which uh, sits on my mantle in Maui in my home. Uh, a beautiful Tiffany uh, glass um, sculpture. It's in the book by the way, it's a picture of it, uh, for Outstanding uh, Program of the Year. So uh, I was very, very proud of that and in that thank you speech that evening, I thanked the editor, Ina Meyer, for supporting us on our 10th year when so many of the district thought Hawaii was simply out of the question and ridiculous. So, so that was number four. Number three, ah, my, one, of, one of my very favorite things, my third favorite thing of all time was the presidential unit uh, because it was a way of teaching students how the President of the United States is elected. We'd start with primaries. Kids had to get signatures from teachers, other students, to enter a primary. And then after the primaries were over, we have three students enter one party and three students enter the other. And they could always pick their party name. It could be the pajama party one year, the sports party, the movie star party, the um, lollipop party, whatever. Pajama party, that was a good one. Uh, and, after, and then, of course, we have this wild convention. And not like today where everybody knows who's going to win when the convention takes place. And nothing, it's not very interesting. <clears throat> we had the conventions where the roll call actually took place and we had the student who had the most votes win that nomination. And, of course, I would, be, I would always come on and say I'm the uh, chairperson and uh, the kids, oh, no, they don't. So I'd say, all those in favor of Mr. T being the chairperson say aye. Nobody would. And I said, all those opposed say nay. And everybody, nay. And then I'd say, 
the eyes have it, I'm the chairperson. You know, like that. <laughs> so they always were a little uh, wondering why I was always the chairperson. But uh, we finished that, we have a wild par uh, parade of states and, and support your candidate. And then when the candidates were chosen, we would have the political rally, which was always one of my favorite things. We'd uh, have the candidates in a convertible, and um, we would have all the other cars behind, decorated in all flags and red, white, and blue decorations. And then we'd have the police come, and they would escort us down to Maranick Avenue to Harbor Island, where we hold our rally. And of course, the traffic, once again, the poor people in the traffic, and the unsuspecting people on, <laughs> on uh, Boston Post Road, as our Students, uh, candidates are waving, they're waving back, wondering what's going on. <clears throat> and then we'd also have the 500 pennies a plate dinner. <clears throat> so we have a fundraising dinner. And the, some parents, you know, did bring the 500 pennies, which was quite, a, <clears throat> quite annoying, all these pennies everywhere. But, and the students would speak to the assembled crowd and tell their, what they are going to do. <clears throat> so then there was platform writing, and there was campaigning, and signs, and posters, and all of this going on, and then the day would come for Election Central, that would be voting day. And of course, once again, I played another part, I was Walter Conkright, or Concrete at the time, and I'd have all my assistants around the room, and they would be covering the East and the West and the South and the Midwest, and we'd have all these tote boards up, and we'd have fake numbers, or, or cut out numbers, and the teacher, with a few students help, would put the numbers up, and I would say, oh, we have some votes coming in from West Virginia. <clears throat> and they would say, yes, West Virginia, the votes are in, they go for candidate X. And then we'd have a big chart, Electoral College, <clears throat> to find out if anyone was going to get to the 270 votes. Many students, even today, write me on Facebook saying that they know about the Electoral College only because Actionville spent so much time <laughs> teaching about the presidential unit. And then, of course, we have the president elected, and we have the inaugural ball with, uh, with music and dancing and food, food, always food, everywhere was food. So um, number three was the presidential election. Number two, of course, was, you know, such, a, such an honor for me to be awarded Disney's American Teacher of the Year Award for Elementary Education in 1999. <clears throat> and um, it certainly was an honor, and it certainly was, I think, the culmination of uh, my understanding that Actionville, after all those years and all those years of teaching, that, that it was a success, that Actionville was a success. Because I was nominated by one of my students, about 800, I don't know, 8,000 people nominated that year, and, uh, or more, and then narrowed down to uh, 55, and I was one of the 55, uh, and then um, they narrowed it down to three people in elementary. And during that time, I had to get uh, people to uh, write recommendations for me. I had to answer certain questions about education. A whole portfolio was sent, and um, then they came to filming. The Disney crew came, and they filmed uh, my day at Actionville, and we were doing some really special things. I was dressed up as Livingston that day. We were going, Livingston uh, and Stanley, were, we were doing Africa. We were going out to look for a capsule that was buried a hundred years ago. And so it was all basically Actionville kind of things, and they filmed it, and they narrowed it down to uh, three minutes, and they showed it in uh, California during the Disney Awards ceremony. And... Um, at the ser at, you had to uh, give a three-minute speech also, and they had judges, maybe 30 judges, from all facets of education, from educators to parents to uh, uh, people who wrote about education. They were just, Disney had assembled a large number of judges. And um, my story, my three-minute story, was based upon the lady from Shambhala, and uh, it's based upon a song that was made many years ago in the 70s called, uh, the, called Shambhala. And I uh, spoke the story uh, just as if I was talking to you tonight. So I went out in the audience and I told the story. And uh, 
And um, I never forget, the gen one of the judges came to me and said, my goodness, he said, there's, n there's no question about who should win because, you know, you were so different than all the others who were standing at a podium and reading everything. And I felt that if you were going to do that, anybody could do that. Mm -hmm. So you have to do two things. You have to make eye contact with the audience and you have to tell a story, basically. And the story is in the book. And I thank the lady from Shambhala because if it wasn't for her, I would have never won that award. And of course, the award uh, is uh, a picture is in the book as well. And uh, even though that was a shining moment for the program and, and for myself, I never felt that that was why I did Actionville. And uh, the reason I think um, that I love the program so much is because of number one. And there's no doubt that this is the most important thing. It's because of all of you. There's no doubt in my mind that if it wasn't for all of those wonderful parents like yourself who entrusted their child with me, and if it wasn't for all of those students who actually volunteered, most of them, to come to the program, and if it wasn't for all of my wonderful staff who worked so hard for so little money for all those years, I would never have accomplished anything. So in conclusion, I want to thank you, all of you and all of my former parents, students, and teachers. And of course, I would be remiss not to thank my parents, who are the greatest inspiration in my life, who gave me all the tools I needed to do what I hoped would be a success. They taught me to dream big. They taught me to think ahead. They taught me to break down any wall that might stand in my way. And I thank all of you for enriching my life and making my educational career one of the most rewarding experiences any human being on this planet could have ever asked for. So thank you very much. That's okay. my top ten, although there's so many other things, and I put them around archaeology, creative writing, Gedney Cemetery, our dinosaur study, roller coasters, creative writing, our trips to Phantom, horseback riding, and dude ranches, of course, Disney, skiing, I would be remiss to not say we ski many times, trip to the Statue of Liberty, all those casino nights somebody mentioned, and learning about probability, um, of course, music. Music is everywhere in Actionville. Taking the kids to uh, Opera Day and also to uh, classical music places at Carnegie Hall. Les Mis, the stock market game, was a favorite where the students pick stocks. And see how there was a gold rush. There's Titanic, uh, World's Fairs, and the American Revolution. Just a, one note about Titanic. After we've studied, I, I'm a big fan of Titanic, I always was, and from when I was little, reading uh, Walter Lord's book, uh, A Night to Remember. When I learned that uh, a piece of Titanic had been raised uh, from the ocean floor and was going to be on display in Boston, I immediately said to the kids, would you, you know, should, should we go? Because we're studying Titanic. Yes, yes. So we took a bus, we went to, for the day we went, up to Boston, and we went to the, uh, the Boston uh, spot where they had it, and basically the gentleman told me we were the first, one of the first school groups ever to touch Titanic. Mm. And uh, it had been laying on, on the ocean floor for uh, since 1912 or something. So that was a very big moment for actionable students as well. And of course, I can go on with so many more stories, but I will not at this point. So, my vision for, for the future of education. Okay? This is called interest-based learning. Interest-based learning is something that I have done many times in Actionville and pre- and post-Actionville, in which a student will tell me what they are interested in. Say, for instance, you're interested in cooking or someone else is interested in lacrosse, or someone is automotive skills, or someone else in uh, skateboarding, or chocolate, or any number of things. You take that topic, and you teach every subject through that topic. 
So a child who doesn't really like to learn, or someone who's a difficult problem in class, because it's not relating to what's going on in the classroom, if you take the child out and you say to the child, what's your favorite thing to do? And I could ask all of you that same question. And the child says, oh, I just love to do this. I love uh, rap music, or I love classical music, I love chess. Then you would, the teacher would, form a plan for that particular child which has not succeeded. Now, other children have succeed because they just would succeed in any, any place. They succeed in Actionville. And I told many parents, your child would succeed anywhere, basically. Even if they weren't in Actionville, they would be just great. But if a child doesn't succeed, and really is a discipline problem, or is, or is having difficult learning, if you were to take the thing that they like best, and teach every subject through that one thing, that child might be more apt to, number one, learn, and number two, be happier in the classroom instead of causing problems. So that is something that I have in the book that I show that you can teach everything, every subject, through a cereal box. Thanks, oh, that's silly, a cereal box. How are you going to do that? Well, you look at the cereal box. Who's the guy up here? It's a Quaker. Talk about history. Let's go back and study history. The Quakers, who were they? Why is, this, why is he up here? Then, you want to teach science? Well, there it is. What's fat? What's saturated fat? What's trans fat? What's cholesterol? Are these things good, bad? How much does it have? Sugar, how much sugar does it have in it? Is that good? What about fiber? What's the difference between soluble fi fiber and not? What, are, what about these vitamins? Are they good for anything? You get 10% vitamin A. What does vitamin A do? Whole science lesson is right there for you. What about math? Well, let's see now. It says it 15.7 ounces, but 445 grams. What's the difference between the metric system and the regular system? How did they get that? So there's math in here. Uh, what about reading? Well, you've got to be able to read the box in order to buy it. And also, math, if you wanted to buy the box, and the box costs $4.53, and you gave the cashier a $5 bill, how much change should you expect? But if you got a penny change, would you, be, would you question that? Or just take the penny and go home? So then there's art. Change the art. What about uh, doing a taste test? Let's taste the cereal, and then let's find out, and let's write a review. That's language arts. That's writing. What about music? Well, let's do a jingle. Let's, oh, the toasted flakes are great, uh, whatever. Let's do a video. Let's do a commercial. Every subject, reading, writing, science, math, art, music, video production, all from one cereal box. So that's the, that's the concept of interest-based learning. All the subjects taught through what you like best. Maybe that might work, hopefully. Now, you say, well, Actionville, they could do it because they had a huge staff. And Mr. T was working at all those jobs and getting all these people to come. How is a regular teacher going to be able to do interest-based learning with a few students and have the rest of the class? All right, here's where this comes in. Action Core is a brand new program, an Action Core of educators. Now, as you know, Governor Cuomo has just stated that certain students are going to be allowed free college on state colleges and universities if you meet certain criteria. Now, these students are getting a wonderful gift. They should give back something. They should be the ones who go into their local schools and help with interest-based learning. After, of course, being interviewed and checked out and so on, here is where you get some people to help the teachers do interest-based learning. And then, of course, there's another avenue that's through AARP. AARP has a thing called Create the Good, where they go to every community and ask seniors if they would help out in different, volunteer in different things. 
And wouldn't it be wonderful if we had some seniors working with some students as well? And then, of course, maybe high schools, maybe colleges might have students who might want to volunteer for credit or something, and they could help. So this is my plan. This is what I'm, in I'm going to be presenting. But you're the first to hear about it as my vision for education for the future. And let it be known that no student should ever leave school without an education. And, uh, and it's difficult because especially today in many cities, uh, I just spoke to some, a teacher. He said, I quit. I said, why did you quit? He said, because I just couldn't take it anymore. He said, I had a kid who took up a garbage pail and threw it at another kid. And then he went out, and then the next day he was back in, and, and same, the same problem. I said, do you think if, if we could have gotten this one kid to, to be separated, to maybe find out what he liked, and maybe help him uh, with somebody he might relate to from college or something, might have been better than the situation of him getting him thrown out all the time. So... We, I don't know. All I know is that Actionville, which used differentiated staff, um, which means that I was the teacher, and then the second salary, as you all know, uh, was given to me to hire um, half-time teachers, teaching aid, teacher aides, college kids, seniors, high school kids, and I always had tons of people in the room. Even when I was at Westchester Day School, I would import people to come into the classroom to help me. Because it really can't do it by yourself. And that was, that was the uh, beauty of Actionville, and really something that would never, you know, it was like uh, an anomaly then, and certainly me, you know, but today with, with more chances of, of, uh, of uh, different kinds of schools, maybe this program might work. So this is my vision. I, if you have any questions about it, I'll be glad to answer them. I want to thank you all again for coming this evening. It was a pleasure to talk to you all. And uh, I certainly uh, thank you again for spending the time with me tonight. And thank you for your time uh, with your child or my student, former student with me at, uh, in my, during my lengthy teaching career. Thank you. Thank you.